terrified children are evacuated from a Connecticut elementary school after a deadly shooting rampage. Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, we have all the latest information about the shooting. And I'm Peggy Pico. We'll also have tips on how to cope with today's tragedy, and we'll take a look at what we can learn from profiles of mass murderers. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by There's no words that uh, there, there's no words that I could come up with um, that would even come close to describing um, the sheer terror of, of hearing that your son is in a place or your child is in a place where there's been violence. Um, you don't know the details of that violence. You don't know the condition of your child and you can't do anything to immediately help them or protect them. That is a, it is a powerless and terrifying experience. One father describes his personal terror while another expresses the nation's grief. The majority of those who died today were children. Uh, beautiful little kids between the ages of five and ten years old. With tears in his eyes, President Obama declares our hearts are broken in the wake of a mass shooting at an elementary school in suburban Connecticut. Police in Newtown, Connecticut say 26 people were killed this morning when a man opened fire at Sandy Hook Elementary School. 20 children are among the dead. The gunman took his own life. Police say there was one other victim at another scene, bringing the total to 28 dead. They haven't officially released many details about the shooting so far, but NPR says it's confirmed the shooter was 20-year-old Adam Lanza, the son of a teacher at the school. NPR reporter Joel Rose joins us by phone tonight from Newtown, Connecticut. Joel, what are we hearing tonight from police there? Local officials are, are being more cautious uh, at this hour. They, they just don't want to release the name of the shooter or any of the other victims, uh, you know, until they have until they are completely certain that they've got the identifications correct. They say that they have preliminary identification for all of the victims um, and that they have contact all, contacted all of the families at this point. Um, you know, they've, they've described generally what happened. Uh, at around 9.30 this morning, the shooter uh, entered the school, Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, uh, and opened fire uh, in possibly several rooms uh, across one area of the school. Um, they haven't said a whole lot more than that. We are expecting confirmation of the victim's names as well as more details about this horrific incident at a press briefing tomorrow morning. And many of these victims are believed to be between 5 and 10 years old. What kinds of reactions are you getting from people in the community there? Uh, people are horrified. They're numb. They're, they're, I think, still largely in shock. This is a uh, relatively well-to-do part of a relatively well-to-do state. Uh, it's a woodsy, um, remote community. It feels very far away from New York City, which is only an hour and a half away, but it, you know, might as well be a world away. This feels like a very safe suburban community, or at least it did until this morning, and I think people are still shocked, horrified, and, and coming to terms with one of the worst shooting deaths and in, in one of the worst school shooting sprees in U.S. history, let alone the um, state of Connecticut. NPR reporter Joel Rose tonight from Newtown, Connecticut with the latest. Back here in San Diego, school districts are working to reassure parents after the shooting. Of course, San Diego Unified Superintendent Bill Coba sent an email to families telling them the district has safety plans for all contingencies. He wrote, Unfortunately, in our society, there are no absolute safe havens from senseless acts of violence, but our schools are safe environments where our students grow and learn each school day under the guidance of dedicated and caring teachers and school staff. Carlsbad schools in the North County took an extra step today, asking police to increase patrols around their campuses. The district says it's a precautionary measure. On its website tonight, Superintendent uh, Suzette Lovely writes, we are doing everything to maintain the safety of all students and staff while also providing a sense of normalcy in our schools. 
The Carlsbad District has experience with school shootings. Two years ago, a gunman wounded two girls on the playground of Kelly Elementary. And San Diego County has seen its share of deadly shooting rampages as well. Two killed at Santana High School in 2001. Three professors shot to death at San Diego State University in 1996. A 1993 shooting at an El Cajon gym left four people dead. 21 people died in a shooting at the McDonald's in San Ysidro in 1984. And five of those victims were children. And back in 1979, Brenda Spencer killed two people and wounded nine others at Grover Cleveland Elementary School. She told police back then she did it because she didn't like Mondays. Many questions remain, of course, about the mass shooting uh, today, including how to talk with your child about it. Peggy Pico has some insights. The country is in mourning over the horrific killings in Newtown, Connecticut. Here's what President Obama said about it earlier today. As a country, we have been through this too many times. Whether it's an elementary school in New Newton or a shopping mall in Oregon or a temple in Wisconsin or a movie theater in Aurora or a street corner in Chicago, these neighborhoods are our neighborhoods and these children are our children. And we're going to have to come together and take meaningful action to prevent more tragedies like this regardless of the politics. It's difficult for all of us joining me now to talk about ways to cope with feelings of sadness, fear, confusions, and a whole lot of unanswered questions about one of the worst school shootings in U.S. history is Wendy Patrick, co-author of Reading People, a book about how to predict behavior, and David Peters, licensed family therapist. Thank you both for uh, joining us on this very sad day. Uh, David, all of us are obviously traumatized by this, but you very personally, uh, very recently, one of your close friends died in the Oregon shootings just two days ago. Um, how are you coping with that? Well, with the usual way, uh, sharing with friends, uh, sharing with old high school friends that Cindy Ewell was killed, and she was uh, a close high school friend. And uh, you share with those high school friends who know, or whoever knows the person who's deceased. Talk, share, cry together, tell stories, and then remember to be alive. Remember to get exercise, to eat, to hug children, and to uh, do the things that give us life. Uh, it's important to mourn the dead. I always tell my clients, grieve purposefully, and then stop grieving and move forward and enjoy the day or enjoy what you can, and then take another time later to grieve again. It, could take weeks or months if it's someone close to you. It was only two days ago that this happened and now this. Um, children, how do parents talk to their children about what's happening? Yeah, this is a real important question. I would say to parents who have young children who don't know yet what's going on, uh, to don't tell them. You know, uh, The smaller the child, the more you want to shield them from this. Uh, and so some children will be coming home from school knowing about this, they all have heard. And the important thing is to find out what they know first. Tell them, what did you hear? What did you see? Uh, let them tell their story. You can confirm what's true and disconfirm what's not true. Uh, and then the rule of thumb is you only tell the children as much as they are capable of understanding. Sort of That's age specific. Age specific. It's very important. And we want to be leaders in our homes. Um, it's not Im it's uh, very important for us to be strong. Uh, we don't want our children, small children, watching TV right now if it's the news. We won't want our children seeing us break down if we're having our moment of truly breaking down, crying with friends or whatever. This is a time for the children to experience, experience us as confident. Uh, and uh, then if they want to grieve, if, if they've seen something on TV and they're scared, it's important to talk with them, reassure them that they're safe. And you can honestly reassure them that they're safe because for the most part, statistically, our schools are safer than they've ever been in, in 20, 30 years. Pretty much since the 70s, and, mm -hmm. and we'll come back to that, I hope. But Wendy, uh, so this Oregon shooting, the uh, shooting in Wisconsin, the shooting in uh, Colorado, uh, how is this one particularly it stood out for you that is different? You know, there's obviously lots of similarities because they're all senseless in the in you know making the point that there's nothing to be gained by going in and shooting up a school or a movie theater or what what have you. You note that this young man, however, was wearing a bulletproof vest. It's different than some of the other shootings where somebody goes in expecting to be killed, death by mm -hmm. suicide, basically mm -hmm. is what we call that. 
One of the other things that I think distinguishes this is Matthew Holmes, for example, the Aurora, Colorado shooting. Many people say that was a, a call for attention. There was a lot of lot that he did to sort of glamorize a character and the outfit and the costume and saying I'm the Joker. Very different than this where we're, we're hearing rumors of a motive. Right. Let's let's talk about your book. It talks about being able to read people and their characteristics. What can we learn from all of these instances? Is there a profile that a mass murder, and I'm not talking about today's because it's mm -hmm. too soon to tell, right. uh, that we can learn from these previous shootings? That's a great question, Peggy, because what happens in this, it's the same in every case. First of all, we hear these rumors about, well, neighbors say he was such a nice guy, he was so calm and sweet and kind. But as investigation continues, we start investigating someone's online profile. We hear about things like sending the spiral, the famous spiral notebook um, that Matthew Holmes allegedly sent to the psychiatrist. We begin to learn more behind the scenes that let you know that even the college graduate, as in the case of the Oregon shooting, PhD students, the Kate of Aurora, even well-intentioned in, uh, in some respects, intelligent people are capable of strategizing this kind of violence, which is which is scary. It's not somebody who just does it aimlessly, but somebody who plans it. It is it is scary, and I think one of the things is that in this particular case, because of, uh, and I might cry about this, because of the children, I think it it holds different significance. Mm -hmm. So what do what do we need to know to sort of have, get a hold of this and yeah. uh, and sort of uh, comfort ourselves? Yeah, this this is hitting people in a very different way because it's children. It's a large number of children, and we expect our children to be safe. We expect our children, we hope our children can be protected. We're going to be watching video of many grieving parents. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to take our time with someone close, a friend, a relative, uh, a husband, a wife, and, and do the crying we need to do. It's important to be real with those emotions. and, and let that out and then gather ourselves together when we're with our children. When we're with our children, we can be leaders, we can be the answer, we can be those that soothe and protect. Uh, all right, all right, we, we are out of time and, and obviously I need a little soothing and protecting myself. I'll take you up on those, I hope we all will. So thank you both so much for talking with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Now for some of the other stories making news tonight. Los Angeles City Council has delayed stepping into the fight over the troubled San Onofre nuclear plant in the North County. They were expected to consider a resolution Friday urging federal regulators to hold hearings before letting the plant go back online. San Onofre has been shuttered since January. L.A. Council members are delaying the resolution for more study. The family of a slain Border Patrol agent is suing federal officials over the botched Fast and Furious gun operation. Agent Brian Terry was killed in 2010 in Arizona. The murder weapon was traced to a failed program to catch gun runners. San Diego Congressman Darrell Issa is leading the investigation into the program. County District Attorney Bonnie Dumat has filed charges today against 28 alleged cartel members accused of running a cross-border methamphetamine smuggling uh, ring. Fronteras reporter Adrian Florido joins us from the News Center with more on this case. Adrian, tell us about the Knights Templar cartel. Who are they and why did the DA and federal agents target them? Well, the Knights Templar cartel is a shoot-off of a more established cartel known as La Familia Michoacan. Uh, it, according to the DA, it's a, it's a shoot-off that has been smuggling uh, really large quantities of methamphetamine and other drugs into the United States by way of San Diego. Uh, today, the district attorney announced charges uh, against 28 people. Uh, it was the result, the charges were the result of a two-year investigation undertaken in partnership with a drug enforcement agency targeting members of this cartel operating here in San Diego and across uh, Southern California. And the DA, DA and DEA are describing this as a major blow to the cartel. How big of a disruption is this to their alleged smuggling business? Well, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell. I mean, they, they, they did file charges against 28 people. They've arrested 15 of those as of now. The rest are still being sought by authorities. Um, but today at the news conference that the DA held with the DEA agents, uh, they didn't really go into specifics about the roles that each of these defendants played within this cartel. Um, the DEA did describe them as mid to high level kind of drug traffickers. 
but it's uh, it's hard to tell you know how big this cartel is and how many more people they they have at their disposal both here in Southern California and south of the border and as we've so often seen uh, when these big drug busts happen a lot of times the people who are taken out by authorities are just replaced by uh, by people who uh, who the drug uh, cartel re re recruits to, to replace them. And so it's hard to tell exactly how big of a blow it'll be. The DA says it's a big blow, but I guess, um, I guess we'll just have to see. Our Frontiers reporter, Adrian Florido. Border Patrol says it won't do any more translating for law enforcement agencies. The new directive comes after criticism of agents along the U.S. border with Canada who were called to translate for police departments. Immigrant rights advocates say agents use those opportunities to deport illegal immigrants. The new rules are not expected to have much impact on the border with Mexico. Agencies on the southern border usually have plenty of Spanish speakers. The number of homeless veterans declined nationally in this year, but as Peggy Pico finds out on our Friday roundtable, the number of homeless vets in San Diego is going in the opposite direction. The U.S. Departments of Veterans Affairs and Housing and Urban Development report a 7% drop in the numbers of homeless veterans throughout the U.S. this past year, but not in San Diego County. Those numbers actually rose here. Joining me on our weekly roundtable with details from her recent report is Jeanette Steele of UT San Diego. Jeanette, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. How many homeless veterans are there in San Diego right now? Right. So uh, on one night in January, every year they count homeless veterans and they discovered that there were a uh, little more than 1,750 in San Diego County. So that's up. It's from up about 100 from the prior January. Yeah. Now, more than 1,000 veterans attended San Diego stand down uh, mm -hmm. this past summer. We can have some video of that so people can see that. How do the numbers of homeless vets here um, compare to the rest of the nation? Right. Well, um, we, we, what we can tell is that um, San Diego is one of the biggest concentrations of new veterans, of post-9-11 veterans, and we know nationally that um, post-9-11 veterans are about 9% of all homeless veterans. And we know that five states, including San Diego, or including California, have the most, uh, um, uh, more than half of the nation's homeless. So yeah, those are Texas, some- Texas, California, Georgia, I think. Uh -huh, New York. Yeah, so we're, we're in the, the upper echelon. Right. What does the VA say that's behind this uh, higher numbers of veterans, especially here in San Diego? Right, and why is it in contrast to the national trend. You know, they don't have really good answers, but here are some elements that might be, it might be high unemployment here. And as we know, unemployment among veteran, young veterans is higher than the national average. Uh, we know that f thousands of Marines and sailors are discharged here in San Diego every year. And so they're concentrated here. Uh, in, in that kind of fragile time when they're trying to figure out how to become a civilian and trying to get a job. And then we also know uh, every year it seems like more people go out and want to be part of this count that they do every January. And this year there were like 750 people went out to do the count. And so there's one theory that it, you know, if more people are counting, they're necessarily going to find more veterans. So so that that might be that they're going to find more. Just, it's mm -hmm. not necessarily that there's that much more. We just may be counting them a little more efficiently. There are more people counting. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about in San Diego? Is there anything else? Let's say mental health services, lack of uh, ability to get these services that people need that you think uh, maybe could contribute to the problem of us having kind of going against the national trend. Well, the VA, you know, the VA has this. Um, program to try to end homelessness among veterans by 2015. And so they're pouring a ton of resources into it. And, and so the problem is just really, are veterans plugging into these resources? Um, and some of the reasons that they might not be plugging into the resources are um, substance abuse, um, n not just not knowing about the, the resources that are there, and um, um, just not being kind of ready to address whatever issues are in their lives that are not allowing them to have a normal life. Let's talk more about that because it's President Obama who started this. You and I were talking years ago, but in he, by 2015, that's only two years from now, he said he wants to end uh, homelessness among veterans. Uh, the VA has earmarked $300 billion to make this happen. Here in San Diego, uh, there's some programs, some new programs. Right. So what's out there as far as what's new for veterans? Right, so um, in the last couple of years, they have announced some new programs that are here in San Diego. Uh, one of them uh, just uh, 
last week, um, um, VA Secretary Shinseki announced they were going to triple the amount of funding for it. It's called Supported Services for Veterans and Their Families. And basically, this is a program that's only a, maybe a year or two old. It's here in San Diego, and you can basically get help for like covering your mortgage, help kind of making, it's a bridge help if you need it to try to not fall into becoming homeless and then chronically homeless. Another program is a demonstration program. Uh, here it's trying to focus on young vets. We're one of five cities in the, in, the, in the nation that has it and this is a similar kind of thing where we'll give you bridge money to cover your utilities or your rent so you can stay in your house. And then one of the more uh, exciting things and expensive is uh, this this Aspire Center that the VA plans to open in the summer in Old Town. We're one of five in the nation that were funded, and it's a five-year project, and it's going to be 40 beds, and it's for younger veterans who need more help than um, just outpatient therapy, but don't need to be hospitalized at the La Jolla VA. Where should families turn if they realize that maybe they're uh, somebody in their family member who's a veteran is struggling? How should they reach out? Right. So um, the VA in La Jolla is actually, veterans in the community say that they, they give quite good care here. I know the VA gets a bad rap nationally, especially about how long it takes to get your claim processed. But um, they do, they have increased the number of mental health counselors here. Um, there are a, a number of 1-800 um, numbers. Um, there's um, my, I think it's called my vet uh, okay. is, is a website. There, the, so you just basically have to call and get get tied in. Reach out, reach out and maybe start at the Veterans Hospital. We're out of time, so Jeanette Steele of UTC San Diego, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. A phenomenon called King Tides pushed ocean levels up in San Diego County and along the entire coast of California for a second straight day. The high ocean levels are prompting environmentalists to talk about climate change. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson joins us. What are King Tides, Eric? Well, as you might have already imagined, they are, in fact, the king of tides. Ocean levels around San Diego County peaked at about 9.30 this morning thanks to a collective gravitational nudge from the Earth, the moon, and the sun. Now, it happens a couple of times a year, so it's not that rare. But these tides are the highest of this year, and the impact was kind of dramatic when it peaked. Yeah, last night was the new moon, so what happened? Well, I've got some pictures for you to look at. The water levels in San Diego Bay actually rose about eight feet above their normal levels. I took a morning ride around the bay in a boat to see what the impact was, and water about a foot and a half below the glass windows at the Fish Market restaurant. Bayside, Homes, and Coronado had steps and patios completely submerged. Some pocket beaches along the bay uh, were underwater, and the wetlands near the South Bay Power Plant were completely submerged. Okay, so how does climate change fit into this equation? Well, Coast Keeper's Travis Pritchard told me that this could be the new normal if climate change pushes up the level of the ocean. And that could have a huge impact on life near the coast. He says, add in a high tide or a storm surge on top of what we had today, and it's easy to see how flooding could cause some major problems. He says other areas would be affected as well because those higher ocean levels would submerge storm drains that now empty into the bay, and that would back up and flood neighborhoods that are some distance from the coastline. Pritchard does say it's kind of a warning light for the future. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson. Stormy weather also tends to bring bigger waves. The Weather Service says we can expect rain through the weekend. Inland temperatures will be just a bit colder than the coast. The winter weather advisory for the mountains has been extended until tomorrow morning. It looks like the desert will be our dry spot. I'm Margaret Warner. On the next news hour, a reprieve from deportation for some young immigrants, plus Shields and Brooks. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. In tonight's Public Square, we wanted to share some of your reaction to today's shooting. Through the Public Insight Network, we asked you what you think we can do to prevent more horrific tragedies like this in the future. P.T. Zeitniger said, we have to accept as a society that there are people with chronic mental health issues and provide them with effective ongoing treatment, just as we do for AIDS, heart disease, diabetes, and other chronic conditions. Several people brought up the issue of gun control. Nadia Bernardo 
Ricardo said the best way is to reevaluate access to weapons and the whole Second Amendment, which was written in and for a very different society and times. Centuries have passed. It's time for some smarter ways of self-defense. And Jason Veraldi wrote, I personally believe that staff need to be armed. It's a deterrent that with proper ongoing training works and works effectively. An armed assailant needs to be met with armed resistance. KPBS will explore the issue of gun control and safety next week. You can join in on this conversation or comment on any KPBS news story by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or just email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. Neighbors of Newtown gathered at a church tonight to mourn those lost in today's shooting. Police have not released many details what we do know for certain. Twenty children are dead. Six adults were also killed at Sandy Hook Elementary this morning. Before the gunman took his own life, there is one other victim at a home in the area. The Associated Press reports it's the gunman's mother who was a teacher at the school. Now, that information has not yet been confirmed by police. They do plan another briefing tomorrow. In the meantime, President Obama says the nation has experienced too many tragedies like today's shooting and is calling for meaningful action to prevent more of them. He's ordered flags to be lowered to half-staff at public buildings across the country. Today's shooting has put the uh, country into mourning, and it's especially difficult for children. The county's behavioral health services has a 24-hour hotline available for anyone who needs help coping. That number is on the screen, 888-724-7240. And PBS NewsHour will have more on this story in just a moment. And we will keep this story updated on kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good night.